<laughs> so let's get ready to play Ancient Mississippian Culture Trivia Night. All right, first question. Why is the Mississippian period called Mississippian? Triangle, these cultures first developed in the Mississippian River Valley. Diamond, these cultures only lived in the area of modern day Mississippi. Circle, the first evidence of these cultures was found in the Mississippi River. Or these cultures only lived along the Mississippi River. So folks at home, you can also take a guess in the chat if you would like. So I see we've got our five answers in. Ooh, very good. So most of our members got that. So let's find out a little bit more. Um, but first, let's see who scored the highest. All right, good job, Pete. <laughs> and not too far behind, Terry. Very good. <laughs> All right, let's learn a little bit more from Glenn. Yeah, so as you can see from this map, uh, Mississippian and related cultures developed along the Mississippi River. When you go through the history of the world, Cultures and civilizations develop near rivers, near bodies of water, because that's where your rich soil is, that's where your agriculture can happen, and that's really what causes civilization is the ability to grow crops and stay in one place. And so the Mississippi River provided the perfect place for that, and as those cultures developed and, and grew, they left signs that you'll learn about later that helped us determine where that culture may have been elsewhere in the nation. All right, very good. And our next question, here we go. Mississippian houses were made using what? Triangle, stone, clay, and grass? Diamond, wood, clay, grass, and animal hide? Circle, wood, cane, grass, and mud? Or stone, uh, or, or stone. <laughs> well, it seems like y'all y'all got ahead, but yes, <laughs> you did it. <laughs> it was indeed wood, cane, grass, and mud, and we'll learn a little bit more from Glenn. But let's see who scored highest on that. Uh oh, Laura is now in the lead, followed by Victor. Victor has a streak of three correct answers in a row. Very good. Still anyone's game. So let's go ahead and we're going to learn a little bit more about the types of shelter that the Mississippians had. All right. So the Mississippians are going to use natural materials that are readily available. Uh, wood of, and all these materials are, of course, going to be closer and more plentiful to the Mississippi River or to other bodies of water. And so you can see this is a this is a pretty sturdy type of structure that's going to provide a lot of protection from the elements, uh, both in winter and in summer. And you can see at the, at the very top, that peak there in the roof, there's actually a hole there that provides for smoke to escape because they would have fires inside the home. Wow. All right, so we learn a little bit about Mississippian shelters. Let's go on to the next question. These were the most important crops to Mississippians and are known today as the Three Sisters. Was it tobacco, sunflowers, and sump weed? Nuts, berries, and wheat? Sweet potatoes, tomatoes, and peppers? Oh, nice. <laughs> Everybody got that one Everybody correct. got that one, yep. Corn, beans, and squash. <laughs> well, let's see who got the answer the quickest. All right, Laura is still in the lead. Way to go, Laura. But Victor has the highest answer streak of four. Very, very good, Victor. Yeah, so this is this has always fascinated me. As as when one learns about it, you think, well, of course, this makes perfect sense. You grow a corn plant, and it and it creates a stalk that that goes vertically. You plant beans in the exact same mound, and the beans use the corn stalk as something that the vine can curl around, and then the leaves from the corn and from the beans provide just the right amount of shade for the squash vines to grow along the ground. And so they would actually, these are not just three crops, they actually plant all these seeds in the same mound together. And as you can see from this, from this picture, they all grow together. They are, they are very complementary, supplementary uh, different types of vegetables, and this was the absolute fundamental basis of Mississippian foodways. And if anyone has actually grown corn beans and squash in this way, please let us know, as, know in the chat. I would be very curious to know. All right, let's move on. Mississippian mounds were built for all of the following reasons, except as a platform for the homes of chiefs, as a burial ground for the elite classes, as a place for guards to keep watch of the town, or as a location for religious ceremonies. So which 
of these is not <laughs> what mounds were used for. Let's see. Ah, very good. Everybody wow, got everyone. that one right. Excellent. And you know what? I thought I might trick y'all with that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see who's in the lead. Uh-oh, Laura is in the lead, followed by Victor. And now Laura has the highest answer streak of five. Excellent, excellent. So let's learn a little bit more about the mound culture. Yeah, so th these mounds are fascinating. And remember me saying that one of the ways we're able to compare and know that a, a Mississippian culture is taking place not at the Mississippi River is really because of these mounds. These mounds survive most obviously. They have them in lots of different places around the what's now the United States. And these mounds were built over time with everyone in the respective city or village participating. And it's weird because in Europe, these mounds were almost always a place that were used as lookouts or watchtowers, but, but not so in North America. As you can see, they were meant for religious ceremonies. The mounds were built up as, as a chieftain or, or part of his family would die. They would incorporate them into the mound. And so these mounds were not only community centers socially, they were literally physically the, the community as the community passed through generations and generations. And so the chiefs and the religious leaders living on top of these mounds really defines this Mississippian culture and the way the religion operates, the way the, the government structure operates. These are very sacred sites. So every mound is something important. Very good. All right, next question. This material was used to create special pendants worn by the elite for spiritual protection or to denote their rank. Marine shells, deer hide, clay, or flint? All right, we've got three answers so far. Four, they're thinking about it. Ah, very good. Almost everyone got that correct. It was marine shells. So let's see who's in the lead now. Laura is still in the lead with an answer streak of six, followed by Victor, but Matt and Carolee are making their way up in the score. All right, let's learn a little bit more about these marine shell pendants. Now, this is one of the things I find most fascinating and revealing because when you think about it, marine shells are not necessarily in the Mississippi River. The, the best ones, the most beautiful and, and workable ones are going to be found down along the coast, especially the Gulf Coast. But how could Mississippian cultures, all the way in northeast Georgia or even up into what is now almost Minnesota, get shells from the Gulf Coast? What this tell because that's where they've been found, right? What this tells us is that the Mississippians had a remarkably complex economy and trade routes and roads that could move these things back and forth. These are not the backwards primitive people that many Europeans who encountered them thought they were. These are complex civilizations and something as simple and beautiful as these marine shell uh, pendants and decorations can tell us so much about how unique and complex these cultures were. Absolutely. All right, next question. A popular game played by Mississippian cultures which required a rolling stone disc and a spear. Was it called stickball, shinny, snow snake, or chunky? Ah, we, <laughs> we had a split. It was indeed chunky. So let's see who got that one. Ooh, nice. Carol Lee's making her way on up. And we also have uh, Laura in the lead with the highest answer streak of seven. Excellent. You've, you've done your research. <laughs> so let's learn a little bit more about chunky. Yeah, so these chunky, I, I believe the way some of the linguistics work, they call it a chunky uh, but we, you know, we Americans tend to squish things together. Chunky, yeah. Chunk, it's a chunky stone. Uh, and these are, these, you, you can find these. These are not terribly uncommon in archaeological finds, which tells you that this was a very popular game. Uh, they're just a stone, right? Some of them are anywhere from three to four inches in diameter. They're, they're almost like a, a thick hockey puck. And the idea was to roll these things along the ground and then, Different stories come to us of how some of the variations, the, the most common seems to have been someone would throw a spear where they thought the stone would stop rolling, and some folks were supposed to throw the spear and hit the rolling stone. Oh. Now, what this means is someone who's rolling the stone is going to try to trick someone else. You have to be good with a spear not only to hit it, but 
if you think you know where the stone's going to land, you may know exactly where it's going to land, but are you good enough to throw your spear and have it stick in that mm. spot? So this is a this is a it's a fun game, it's a complex game, and it is very much a spectator game that was just everywhere the Mississippian culture was. Oh, I would love to play that. That'd be so fun. We need to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go with our next question. Ancient Mississippians used this metal to create tools and art. Was it gold, copper, manganese, or bronze? Oh, wow. <laughs> Very good. So most people got that. It was indeed copper. Let's see who's on the scoreboard now. Ah, Pete rising in the ranks. Uh-oh, Victor now has an answer streak of eight correct answers, but Laura is still in the lead. So let's learn a little bit more about copper and its usage. So, yeah, so you can see in this photograph, these are actual um, examples for, uh, from archaeological finds. And the thing with copper is that it's found naturally. It can be very much on the surface, and it's easily worked with stone tools or with wood tools. Uh, it's it's fairly fairly malleable, but it can also be made very shiny. It can be made into certain shapes, and it can still take somewhat of an edge. So that this photograph here is actually uh, of a variety of copper axes. Now you know we think of I think the most common thing we think of when we think of copper is a penny, <laughs> and you probably wonder you know a, is a bunch of pennies going to make that effective of an axe? Um, well. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes better than a stone, even if you have to keep reshaping it and resharpening it. And it's really the, the only metal that the Mississippians used, but they did have access to it, um, and they did use it for a lot of things, both practical and decorative. And I'll show uh, a, f a picture of um, a rendering of uh, engravings made from copper. Glenn, you won't be able to see this okay. uh, on your screen, but... Um, folks at home can see this, and um, like Glenn was saying, that there were several methods. I mean, they would use some heat, but a lot of it was also cold working the copper. And much of the copper would come from the Great Lakes area through those trade networks that we were talking about earlier. And just like Glenn said, they'd be embossed, like you see on the screen here, using stone, wooden, and bone tools. And it's just just stunning the, the how detailed um, these decorative items are. All right, let's go on to our next question. This site has 80 mounds within a three and a half square miles and was the largest urban settlement of the Mississippian culture. Was it Cahokia Mounds, Etowah Mounds, Tuskegee Mound, or Fort Walton Mound? Let's see if you've heard of this one before. All right, we've got our five answers in. Ah, I figured that might be a little tricky, especially for our, our members in Georgia. <laughs> um, yes, it was Cahokia Mounds, and we'll learn a little bit uh, more after we see the scoreboard. Ah, very good, Pete. Pete moved on up. <laughs> Everyone else stayed where they were. So Cahokia, um, yeah, why don't we learn a little bit more about this since it was among the largest of the mound complexes. Right, and so this is, you know, this is one of those that actually gave the name, and, you know, a confluence is where... Um, running water sources come together. And so where Mississippi, Missouri, and Illinois rivers come together, that's a that's a pretty significant confluence. And remember those trade routes. So the, 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 those rivers are all going to be major trade routes, and that comes together. And best we can tell, this is, by a bit, the largest single Mississippian city uh, living complex that, we, that there ever was. It's certainly the biggest one we've ever discovered. And you can sort of see from this artist rendering – how many houses and and how many mounds there were in this in this complex and and population estimates vary it it could be as high as you know thirty to forty thousand people uh which is a pretty i, I think I'm getting that right i actually uh, i believe it was um 10 to 15,000 15. people, okay. whereas a typical mound complex might have been as low as 100 to a 1,000 or 1,000 people. But Cahokia, the estimates are that the height of its population was between 10 to 15,000 okay, people, you. which is still quite, <laughs> quite that, a that, lot more. That's, that's quite a bit for, for a, a Mississippian era. And, and so, and notice too, you can see in the center there, um, there is a large open field there in the middle of the town, and that would have been used for gatherings, for religious purposes and to play Chunky. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, let's move on to our next question. 
this mound site is the most intact Mississippian culture site in the southeast. Is it Belcher Mound Site, Holy Bluff Site, Letchworth Mound Site, or Etowah Mounds Site? And you can see a photo of it right there. Uh, now we got it. Yeah, yes. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it was coming up. <laughs> Indeed, it was Etowah Mound Site. So let's see who's moving on up in the scoreboard. Lara uh, staying where she is. Matt coming up. Very good, very good. So let's learn a little bit more about Etowah Mounds. And, of course, if you are a Georgian, we highly recommend visiting Etowah Mounds. Yeah, and I think this is this is sort of one of those rites of passage for anyone who's in North Georgia. You you go to Etowah Mounds at some point in middle school. Uh, for, for me, it was seventh grade. But it's it's not nearly as big as Cahokia, but it is one of the largest ones and most significant finds in the southeast. And they've done a lot of archeo- uh, excuse me, archaeological work here, and they've found some remarkable uh, anthropomorphic figures and carvings that are the only things we have that give us an indication of what decoration and dress might have been like for Mississippian cultures. And it's from two statuettes that were found at Etowah. And it's, it's a well-preserved site. You can visit there. You can go up to the top of the mounds. Uh, it's it's a great day out, and they also have a fantastic museum and visitor center. And I'm also going to show uh, an artist's rendering of what uh, the Edoa City Complex looked like, kind of similar to what we saw with Cahokia, of course, m- on a much smaller scale. Um, but you can see the mound complexes there and the, the homes surrounding and the, and the big ceremonial um, flat part that, uh, that Glenn was talking about earlier. All right, let's go to our next question. This type of tree had spiritual significance to many Mississippian cultures. Is it cedar, weeping willow, magnolia, or fir? All right, looks like we've got our answers almost in. I believe we're waiting on one more. There we go. Oh, excellent. So it was a little bit split, but it was indeed cedar. So let's see who got those right. Uh Uh-oh, Victor is now in the lead. Let's see if Laura can (laughs) regain her spot. Uh, Very good, very good. All right, so let's learn a little bit more as to why cedar. Yeah, so cedar, and this is something, you know, that that Libba had to share with me. I wasn't sure what the answer to this one was. (laughs) Um, But cedar was used uh, primarily because it's easy to work, but it also, I mean, we all have cedar chest, right? It gives off a very, very distinct odor, uh, the scent. Um, and the durability of the wood mean that it's going to have certain special magical properties mm. that can happen, you know, not just in practical everyday, but have a large amount of influence on some of those religious practices, like, like this mask that is shown here that is made out of cedar. And another thing that I learned is that these w- cedar would also be used specifically for purification ceremonies. So perhaps that has something, a connection to that, that very um, pleasant and, and familiar scent or distinct scent as well. All right, let's move on to our next question. This conquistador encountered late Mississippian cultures during an expedition in the southeast from 1539 to 1543. Was it Hernan Cortez, Hernando de Soto, Francisco Pizarro, or Diego de Almagro? I hope I'm saying Diego's name correctly. (laughs) Almagro. (laughs) All right, we got our five answers in. Let's see. Ah, very good, very good. Most of you got that. It was indeed Hernando de Soto. So let's see who's in the lead now. Victor, still on fire. Three in a row. Very good. All right, so let's learn a little bit more about Hernando de Soto. Right, and this is this is an absolutely fascinating topic. We're not exactly sure what path he took uh, from Florida up through what is now Georgia, South Carolina, maybe North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi. Um we think he came somewhere through northeast Georgia. There are three accounts of his expedition, uh, but they don't, you know, they didn't have GPS back then, that back then, so they didn't write down exactly where they were at. But the interesting thing about DeSoto is that a couple of other conquistadors came to the New World, um, smashed in to get whatever wealth they could and and get back out. DeSoto's intent, of course, was to get rich, but his primary intent was to establish an inland colony, not one along the coast, which is why this expedition had 600 people. Um, 
and it's men and women. Several women were with this expedition. He brought not just soldiers, but um, like as I said, women. He brought priests. He brought carpenters, blacksmiths. But long story short, he got into some trouble. He got too deep into the interior. He got into a big disagreement with some Native Americans at the at a place called Mabila, uh, which is now close to Mobile, Alabama, uh, where he lost most of his supplies. Uh, DeSoto ends up dying of dysentery. He his body is rather unceremoniously dumped into the Mississippi River, and the uh, haggard remains of this expedition finally find their way back down to the Mississippi, the mouth of the Mississippi, and barely escape with their lives. It's a it's a. I know I'm going on too long, but it is a fascinating story. It really is, absolutely. All right, let's go on to our next question. True or false this time? Most of the late Mississippian cultures perished due to starvation. True or false? All right, everybody got that correct. So it was indeed false. We'll learn about the actual reason in just a moment. Let's see who is on our scoreboard. Victor's still in the lead. All right, take it away, Glenn. Yeah, so... uh, this is what happens. This this is really the most remarkable and important legacy of DeSoto's expedition. When DeSoto came through, he uh, he left these diseases behind him. They, the, the natives thought they had gotten rid of the threat when he passed over uh, the next mountain ridge, but leaving smallpox, uh, typhoid, cholera meant that these natives who did not have immunities built up to these diseases were going to die. And this is probably, it's one of, if not the largest biologic disasters in world history. Uh, Close estimates think that because of DeSoto and other Europeans coming into native lands in North uh, and South America led to a decrease decrease in the population between 80 and 90 percent. It was truly apocalyptic and catastrophic. Mm. All right, let's go on to our next true or false. Many modern Native American tribes are descendants of ancient Mississippian cultures. True or false? Ah, very good. Most of you got that one right. It is indeed true. So, uh, Glenn, tell us about those tribes that are likely descended from these cultures. Right. So, uh, as I said, it's the disease is, is what decimated, well, more than decimated, almost wiped out uh, the Native Americans. And, and even the ones that survived were not enough, number-wise, to maintain the civilizations, the Mississippian culture that had been building up over the last several hundred years. And so, literally what happened is civilization collapsed. Mm. And so they left these centralized cities and towns, and they dispersed into the countryside so that they could have enough land to live on, to farm, and to, to fend for themselves. And so these, these splintered remnants of these Mississippian civilizations came to be what we think of today as, as the more familiar Native American tribes, such as the Cherokee Creek, Choctaw. Uh, Choctaw. Um, and so... They're really the survivors of this earlier Mississippian culture. And there is a lot of disconnect, but there's also some continuity that you see with these tribes in terms of a religion of religion, in terms of social structure, and especially in terms of oral traditions. All right, it's time to see who won. And it was in third place, we had Carol Lee. In second place, we had Laura. And in first place, we had Victor. Congratulations, Yay! Victor. And of course, uh, to our runners up as well, Terry and Matt. And thank you to all of our members uh, who joined us today. Um, this was super fun. This was our very first uh, live trivia for our members that we've done this month. And we hope that. Um, even more members will join us as we do these uh, live trivias and that folks at home will also join us too. So thank you all. Now, if any of you do have uh, any questions for us, any curiosities about the Mississippian cultures, um, do let us know in the chat. And we can also uh, recommend some of our live stream programs mm-hmm. as well as uh, our, our webisodes that we have. So check out our YouTube and you can find out even more about not only the ancient Mississippian cultures, but those later cultures of that, uh, like the Creeks and the Choctaw 
um, that descended from them. So uh, thank you and congratulations to all of our uh, wonderful members who got to join us. And if you would like to become a member of the Northeast Georgia History Center, go ahead and go to www.negahc.org slash member. And of course, if you are a teacher in Georgia or a homeschool group, then you can also get a free um, digital membership. So we hope that you will uh, take advantage of that. All right, everyone, thank you so much for